Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia, PA. Um, this morning, we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Um, some of you are aware that there were recent press reports of um, China um, uh, having a test flight of a potential nuclear capable hybrid supersonic glide vehicle that has uh, uh, piqued a lot of curiosity. So this morning, to make sense of it, uh, we will have with us Dr. Laura Grego, who is with the Stanton Nuclear Security, or she's a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at MIT, and she's an expert on weapons and missile defense. Uh, moderating this discussion is our very own Dr. Aaron Stein, who is our Middle East Program Director, our Research Director, and our National Security Program Director as well. He's also the host of FPRI's Arms Control Wonk and Chain Reaction Podcasts. Um, before I turn it over to Aaron, I want to remind everyone to put your questions in the Q&A. Go ahead and start putting them in whenever you have them, because I know Aaron sometimes draws on them throughout the program. Also, before I turn it over, I'd like to say thank you to our members and sponsors and our board members who may be on this call. Um, we can't do this without you, so please uh, uh, if you're not already a member, please consider becoming one. Um, there's a lot of terrific content and great programs that FBRI does, and uh, we can't do it without your support. So thank you. So without further ado, I shall turn it over to Aaron Stein. Thanks, Raleigh. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining virtually. Um, I want to welcome again uh, Dr. Laura Grego. Um, she's a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at MIT's Laboratory for Nuclear Security and Policy, and she's on leave from the Union of Concerned Scientists Global Security Program, where she is a uh, senior scientist and research director. Uh, she is also a great follow on Twitter if you want to um, uh, uh, keep up to date with all of the things that are going on on hypersonics or space. And so I thought, given the news in the Financial Times recently, that, 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 that Dr. Grego um, is the perfect person to, uh, to, to discuss this with us. The way this is going to work is we're going to do 10 to 15 minutes uh, of, of, of opening remarks. And then we will turn it over to uh, moderated discussion. And that moderated discussion is very much dependent on questions being submitted. So uh, if you are interested, have questions, don't understand something, this is the place to ask. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, we've all been on Zoom for long enough, but just a reminder, you hit the Q&A function and just type it in and I will moderate the chat. Um, and if you have any problems with that, um, um, you can always use the chat function. I will scale, uh, go back, uh, back and forth between the two. And finally, before I turn it over, uh, I just wanted to say that we at FPRI are with the generous support of Jim and Janet Avril, beginning to expand our work on China, uh, launching a China center with a focus on new technology and geoeconomics. Uh, and so this event is very timely because it is one of those things where we look at sort of technology and its potential destabilizing factor in the bilateral relationship between the United States and China. So with that, uh, Laura, if I may, uh, the, the floor is yours. Well, um, thanks, Aaron, and thanks to PRI for the invitation to speak today. Um, it seems like the job I have set in front of me gets harder and maybe a little bit weirder as time goes on with um, the late breaking news last night of the laws of physics being defied. I think I'll, you know, preview my conclusions that I think that's very unlikely. Uh, that the laws of physics would be defied. But um, I'm also going to preface my remarks by saying that I'm a physicist, but I'm a generalist, and there are plenty of people probably on this call who know some of the technical details of these systems better than me, and I'd encourage those to speak up. But, um, but what I'd like to do today is to sort of parse the details that have been published in the Financial Times articles, taking into account the various agendas and perhaps various games of telephone that the information passed through, um, and then I'll try to make some sense technically and strategically of them. Um, and, and also what I'd like to do is to draw out the larger picture of what might motivate China to pursue novel types of strategic delivery systems. So um, I'll do my best to explain things and I will encourage us all to keep an eye out for more information, but neither rush to judgment or panic. So um, 
Earlier this week, the Financial Times reported that China had tested a nuclear capable hypersonic glide vehicle on a around the earth trajectory. And last night it was reported that, we're, that there were actually two tests, um, one in July and one in August. Um, so let me first say that with the information reported, nothing appears to be revolutionary. And in fact, the technologies as described are decades old. Um, so to sort of, it may be helpful to give a larger picture of what the technologies mean. Um, and, and maybe the first thing is to say what the technologies perhaps aren't. Um, you, you would be comparing these new delivery systems to uh, the standard technology of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I'll use the word, I'll use the acronym ICBMs throughout my remarks. So ICBMs that would reach the continental United States from China, for example, or the reverse, uh, can be launched with a few different strategies. Um, normally it, they're launched on what's called a minimum energy trajectory. And that's the way to get the maximum range from a given missile and payload. You kind of intuitively choose this, like if you're familiar with base bullet or if you ever throw a ball, you don't throw a line drive or a pop-up if you want the ball to go far. You throw it at about a 45 degree angle. Your brain is doing that calculation for you. Um, for an ICBM, that angle is a little bit lower, about 22 degrees above the horizon. And that payload, which is for, for ICBMs, you know, exclusively nuclear weapons, um, that goes up through the atmosphere and goes quite high up into space, somewhere about around 1,300 to 1,500 kilometers altitude. So up where low Earth orbiting satellites inhabit. Um, and then it comes back down to its target on the other side of the world. And that whole thing takes about 30 to 40 minutes. And nearly all of that is in the vacuum of space. There are some reasons to choose to launch missiles in other kinds of trajectories. For example, you can trade off some of that energy efficiency and use what analysts call a depressed trajectory, what you might naturally think of as a line drive. And that can get the weapon to its target faster, but that trades off either range or weight or payload. Um, so for countries, for launches between countries in the Northern hemisphere, and that's really all we're concerned with, the shortest path is gonna be northward up and over the Northern latitudes of the globe. And I know politically, we kind of think about things as east-west, but when we're talking about missile trajectories, we're really connected north-south. you know, north -south. Um, Ballistic missile launches are predictable and very well determined once their launcher burns out after just a few minutes, uh, and they're coasting. So that they travel through a relatively narrow set of paths up over the North Pole, and they do so predictably, is the reason that we can even really consider building defenses against them at all, because it's a fairly bounded problem. Um, and that's why countries right now, especially the United States, build strategic missile defenses that have depended on that predictability. In the 60s, when faced with the possibility that their adversary would mount a defense to avoid ballistic missiles, or to, to ballistic missiles, the US and Soviet Union looked into other ways to counter or avoid those defenses. Um, and one way to do that would be to travel from an unexpected direction. So now we're catching up to the story of this week. Um, one of those strategies is to put the payload into an Earth orbit rather than popping up in an ICBM trajectory and then deorbit it when it gets to the right place. If you do that, you your uh, missile has essentially unlimited range and it can circle the globe until it is intentionally deorbited when it gets to its target. So it can come from an unpredictable direction rather than really from the north. Um, if this idea of putting something into orbit and come, coming back down sounds familiar, it should. Uh, we do this all the time. We put astronauts and other things in orbit and bring them back. Uh, the idea of putting weapons into orbit and then deorbiting them um, is often called orbital bombardment, and it's really the same physics. Um, what the reports this week suggest China's test did was to, was to put what they described as a nuclear-capable missile into a orbital bombardment trajectory, or sometimes it's called fractional orbital bombardment trajectory, which just means it hasn't made a complete you know, 360 degrees around the Earth, um, meaning it, it put something to orbit and brought it down. So um, because the Earth rotates under that orbiting object, when it comes back around full circle, it isn't exactly where it started. So maybe the reason to do just a single orbit is to make sure the landing spot is near the launch spot for convenience sake. Um, 
for, a, you know, if there were actually a, a nuclear weapon system, the reason you might consider doing a fractional orbit is that the Outer Space Treaty, which um, the United States, Russia, China, almost every country is a signatory to, uh, bans the orbiting or stationing of nuclear weapons in space. Um, and so there is a, a legal analysis which suggests that as long as the weapon doesn't make a complete orbit, um, it's possible that it may not have contravened this obligation under the Outer Space Treaty. So that's, when you hear fractional orbital bombardment system, that's trying to essentially get through that loophole. So again, uh, the technical ability to put things into orbit and bring them back down is decades old. Uh, China with its advanced space program can certainly master such a technology. So there's really not a surprise that they could do that. The other piece of technology described in the article is, is that the payload wasn't just deorbited, but the payload was a maneuvering hypersonic vehicle. So hypersonic in the strict you know, semantic sense describes just how fast something moves. And that's you know, like five times the speed of sound. But generally the way um, it's commonly um, thought of when you say hypersonic missile, it's really about the capability for that missile to start fast, but use aerodynamic forces through the atmosphere to maneuver. So it really means something goes fast and maneuvers. Um, the United States, Russia, and China have been testing such systems, uh, usually in, in a mode that people describe as boost glide, meaning you put this maneuvering vehicle on top of an ICBM, and after it launches, release it, and it dives back down into the atmosphere. So this way of testing or, or using a hypersonic uh, missile is a little different from that model. It, it suggests that China would have put it into orbit and released it from orbit rather than from an ICBM. So, but in any case, both of these technologies, orbital, fractional orbital bombardment systems, deorbiting hypersonic maneuvering missiles, um, those are technologies that have existed for decades. Um, I, I would also like to say that putting something to orbit and having it land in a controlled way using aerodynamic maneuvers to a specific location describes what was in those articles, but it also exactly describes other types of missions, including the space shuttle and the US space plane, the X-37B. Um, Chinese officials have described uh, what happened as a test of reusable space technology. Um, although it isn't clear that the sources in the foreign in the Financial Times article were talking about the exact same tests as the Chinese uh, foreign affairs officials were talking about, but uh, a test of reusable space te technology is a consistent description of that same basic technology of putting something into space, bringing it back down in a controlled, maneuverable way. The Foreign Times uh, Financial Times article also suggested that what was launched was nuclear capable. Though whether that is a description of how much the map, how much mass that spacecraft could have carried, or if it looked like the vehicles described by China as nuclear capable was the reason it was described as nuclear capable, I can't tell from the news reports. It's it's completely unclear. Um, so what we have is a very general description of the technology. Um, so when officials are quoted as saying it defies the laws of physics, this is certainly not going to be true. But what they may be reflecting is that China has made some advance in engineering to improve the missile's performance that some person was very impressed by um, because hypersonic missile technology, um, you know, there are cutting edge technologies that are being developed um, to make those go farther and work better. Um, China's interest in all of these technologies is not surprising. It's been working on them for decades and both the Pentagon and Chinese military comment on them frequently. So we know that, that that's, they have research programs. Um, they published in the open literature and um, you know, US intelligence officials speak openly about these, about, about their concern here. China has publicly displayed its hypersonic boost glide missile in a 2019 military parade. So there shouldn't be shock or surprise that China can do these things or that they are doing these things. Um, so, um, so I guess, so why would um, China be pursuing these new technologies? Um, so there, you, I'm sure you've heard plenty talk about hypersonic missiles and a lot of people call it hypersonic hype because they're described as being revolutionary and bringing capabilities that 
don't exist or or things that um you know that, that they're on the cutting edge again i'll emphasize that the united states developed these types of uh, uh um, maneuvering vehicles back in the 60s and sort of abandoned them as not really having any useful mission to pursue but you know um there's another relook it's become something that all the, there's sort of a, an arms race about it um china and russia are developing them you, nobody wants to be left behind um so hypersonic missiles there are um claims about what they can give you that you couldn't otherwise have um uh, there have been claims that um, the hypersonic speed allows these missiles to travel intercontinental distances between China and the United States, for example, within minutes, um, and that it would have the time a nation would have to respond to an attack. So yes, hypersonic weapons are fast, but you know, um, even the first modern missiles were nearly hypersonic. Um, intercontinental range ballistic missiles, um, which have been you know, fielded since the 60s, travel much faster. Um, uh, hypersonic weapons, um, because they dive back down into the atmosphere in order to maneuver, well, those maneuvers um, bleed off speed. So by the time they reach their target, they're going slower than, um, than an ICBM would. Um, so while, the, while an ICBM has a longer path, it goes up high and comes down low, it has a longer way to go. Um, the actual time to delivery is really all, is not all that different. And that is, again, sort of 30 to 40 minutes. Um, you can make it go faster by the shortest range, you know, by a tra depressed trajectory, as I said, sort of a line drive or a FOB strategy that took the shortest route rather than the most unpredictable route. Um, but all of these things really are tens of minutes. Um, there's this other claim that hypersonic weapons um, are invisible. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, ballistic missiles are notable because their, their paths are very predictable. Once they're launched, you pretty much know where they're going. Um, and hypersonic weapons can maneuver and be unpredictable um, and that they're invisible. Well, it, it is true that ground-based radar systems that uh, countries have developed to for defenses and early warning about ballistic missiles are really suited to ballistic missile detection, that isn't the only option. And, and really, um, all technologically advanced nations like the United States and Russia and soon China will have uh, space-based infrared sensors that can see the launch of a missile. And for something like a hypersonic weapon that's maneuvering at high speeds in the atmosphere and become very hot, uh, those can be detected by space-based sensors. So, they're not invisible, we're not blind to them. So the idea that they're extra fast or invisible don't really hold up. Okay, so given these technologies, what might the motivation be for China to be pursuing them? Well, I mean, first, technology development can just drive itself. Experiments can be an endpoint to technology development and the desire not to be left behind other countries um, rather than an expression of a coherent policy. Um, there's just, of course, abundant literature to to show how that sometimes happens. And of course, industrial and political interests can play a role. There's no surprise there that just bureaucratic interests and financial interests can keep technology projects moving forward. Um, but of the strategic reasons, um, I think it's primarily because China sees US missile defenses as a major threat to the survivability of their um, nuclear deterrent. Um, the United States, um, af especially after exiting the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002, has been free to pursue strategic missile defenses um, uh, and has in earnest over the last 20 years, uh, spent tens of billions of dollars and, and decades of effort. Um, and those strategic defenses are meant specifically just to counter the relatively unsophisticated and smaller North Korean ICBM inventory. But, you know, geographically, North Korean and Chinese missiles would come from more or less the same direction. And China is concerned that um, although US missile defenses work poorly uh, right now, that there may be some breakthrough someday and that um, those investments investments in um, those missile defenses to make them much more effective, plus other technologies that can hold 
Chinese missiles at risk before they're launched or their command and control systems. Um, may one day convince the United States that China does not have a secure ability to retaliate in the, in the first strike, and that might alter the strategic balance. Um, so uh, I would like to emphasize that China's current intercontinental ballistic missiles are already more than capable of overwhelming existing US defenses, and they're building more ICBMs. So it isn't you know, strictly necessary from a technical point of view to build exotic new systems that can get around or um, maneuver uh, in, in defeat US missile defenses, but it isn't a surprise that China would seek strategies to negate US missile defenses. So for its part, the US seems to be set on seeing these new technologies as an aggressive move rather than a predictable answer to US strategic investments. I predict we'll probably see calls for building new and more missile defenses, calls that we can't delay you know, our enormously expensive nuclear modernization project. And, and if that sounds familiar, it is. That offense defense cycle has strong similarities to the one that the US and the Soviet Union engaged in. And it took years to come to a shared understanding that offense and defense need to, that, that, that cycle investments need to be nipped in the bud. I mean, I'm not still entirely sure that complete, the understanding is completely shared, but, um, but we know that um, there's, a, there's a strong connection between offense, defensive investments and offensive postures. Um, so I, that's sort of the, the basics of, of what I know about this test. And I'd be happy to have more discussion and, and take questions about what I've said. Thanks so much. Thank you, that was, that was excellent. Um, we have a few questions in the chat um, and I encourage you to ask more because again, now is the time. Uh, I wanted to just double down, use the moderator's prerogative on a, on a few of your thing, on a few of your points. One is, you know, the, can you really distill, because I, you know, the thing about the Financial Times piece is that I personally think it focused on the wrong aspect of it, right? So it led with the hypersonic rather than the fractional orbital bombardment system. Can you talk a little bit more about why hypersonic gliders are actually slower than ICBMs and how like, you know, the trade-offs that you make by, by investing in maneuvering versus that ballistic trajectory that comes straight down? Sure, um, so a hypersonic missile, so we're, we're gonna talk about a glider because that's the important part of it, not really the speed. Um, the way, what allow, what allows it to maneuver is that it is within the atmosphere and using aerodynamic forces. So if you, the thing you compare that to is a ballistic missile, which spends nearly all of its time up in the vacuum of space with nothing to push against, it's just going up and, go, and coming down. So in order to maneuver, it needs to um, use those air, sort of, you know, lift. Lift comes from, lift comes from aerodynamic forces, but, but it, um, it bleeds off speed in order to make maneuvers. It's just, it, it slows you down the air resistance. And um, so by the time it gets to its target, it might be coming from a less predictable direction, but it's likely to be slower than, uh, than a ballistic missile. So you're trading off one, one thing for another. So I guess the concern, the idea might be if, if you've optimized your defenses for a specific threat, like a ballistic missile threat, which will be predictable and coming fast, then a hypersonic missile, you know, your system isn't adapted or optimized for hypersonic. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be, it just has, has not been because that's, that's not where, how, how we've organized things. So um, you would really want to set up your sensors differently. You want to be looking in different directions. You, you just do things differently. Um, and you'd have to, of course, defend um, defend against a hypersonic missile within the atmosphere. Um, and that right now the um, strategic missile defense systems that the US fields, primarily the ground-based mid-course defense is an exo-atmospheric defense, meaning it launches um, kinetic interceptors, these um, little sort of file cabinet size kill vehicles, which are basically just like a sensor with a directional thing to run into, run into the the warhead as it's going through space. 
if you want to catch a um, hypersonic missile, you have to do that within the atmosphere. So that's just a different type of kill vehicle. You couldn't use the same one and you need a different technology. We do have systems that are built to do that. The um, uh, THAAD system, the Army's transportable THAAD system, which is meant for like defending a small area, like a like a military base or a small city um, has interceptors that work within the atmosphere. And, and so it's not that there's no technology to do that, but it's just adapted for a different purpose. So it isn't in, undefendable. Um, so uh, the challenge for um, these hypersonic glide vehicles, especially for intercontinental range missions is that they are going really fast in the, the ability to manage the heat of the, of, of something going through space is a real challenge. It's a material science challenge. It's an engineering challenge. I mean, so uh, it's similar to the challenge of, of bringing back spacecraft, you know, safely, especially when you have human beings on them. So it's, there's, there's a lot of uh, research and energy there, but, but so hypersonics are just a different way to deliver something with different optimization. I'm gonna ask one more moderator's question, then I will go yeah. to, the, to the thing. The U.S. sensor architecture for this is arrayed towards the North Pole, right? It's right. it's um, you know radars in the U.K., Greenland, and with interceptors in Alaska, forty-four interceptors in Alaska, and I think four in California, but it's really the forty-four uh, in, mm -hmm. in Alaska. Mm -hmm. the, the way in which it's described that these interceptors work is that you basically fire four interceptors per one missile. Right, so if you have 44 interceptors, it's really only designed to, to deal with 11 missiles. Um, and we can talk about sort of like single, single mode of failure um, if you're using the same kill vehicles across 44. But the thing that the, the FT story talked about is that, you know, you, and I wanna reiterate this, they went the other way around. You know, yes. Can you talk about the challenges about going the other way around for US sensor mm -hmm. architecture um, combined with that hypersonic, so it, it, it wiggles. I always like to say the hypersonics wiggle as they come mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. versus the northerly arc ballistic missiles in terms of defense. And then I'll turn over to the audience. After. Okay, sure. Um, okay, so those are two problems. I think I spent a ton of time on the last question about the challenge of, of detecting maneuvering hypersonic missiles. So really what that kind of does is drive you to space-based sensors, which are looking down on the earth rather than up and over the horizon. So, you know, um, so that you would not fly under the radar. So, yes, so the sensor architecture, because when you, uh, and I encourage anyone who has like Google Earth or even a, a globe in your house to look and see what's the shortest distance between anything, North Korea, China, United States, it all goes sort of right over the pole. And so obviously you are going to, build all of your radars looking for things coming that direction because ballistic missiles are hard to build. Long range missiles are very hard to build. So you're gonna optimize, you're not gonna take a long direction if you don't have to, you're gonna make, you're gonna do the easiest, most effective thing. So there, all those radars are arranged um, expecting things to come from that direction. So this, FOBs or orbital bombardment strategy, which was experimented with, of course, in the 70s, not, not this experimented with, but deployed in the, in the 60s. Um, and what may have been tested um, this summer by China is to put something in orbit and it's gonna come around from the South. So it's gonna come around from a direction you're not expecting. So we don't have radars, you know, in, I don't know, like Arizona or Texas looking for things coming over there. I mean. They're, they're not optimized to do that. Um, but it doesn't mean we wouldn't know it was, we wouldn't know anything about it. Any launch, any space launch is going to be detected by the United States within a minute or two by space-based infrared sensors. It, there's gonna be no surprise that something was launched. Um, and you can tell, even from the infrared sensors, you're gonna tell something about what direction it's going. You may be able to, I haven't done this analysis, but you may be able to tell, yes, this is an orbital launch rather than an ICBM pretty quickly. Um, so you're gonna know there's something headed somewhere and generally where it's going. Um, and then 
uh, FOBs or an orbital bombardment system. So, so once it's in orbit, it's not in powered flight anymore. It's just go left on, on, on left doing nothing. We'll just have it go around and around and around, right? So then the second thing you need to do for one of these systems is to deorbit. So you have to actively use energy to stop it from being in orbit. So you have to once again burn, uh, you know, miss burn an engine to slow it down and to change its velocity directive. That too should be picked up by space-based infrared sensors. We don't have the best coverage in the south because we're not expecting to look at a lot of things over there. Um, but I think that, can, again, I haven't done the full analysis. If it can be amel ameliorated with what we have or probably what the United States may field, I, you know, again, you just see what those things are. Um, it would be, those would not be appropriate, like enough to, to target or defend against those missiles um, necessarily, but we already don't have an ability to defend against ballistic missiles robustly. So it isn't like an essential change in vulnerability. It's just a different vulnerability. You're, you're, it's still delivering the same payload that you can't really defend against. You're still gonna get a nuclear weapon where it's going without being able to defend it, whether it's coming from the south or whether it's coming from the north, there, uh, there's not much you're going to be able to do about it. Right. I will stop asking questions, uh, but I will turn it over. We have 12 in the chat and there's a few that are similar. And so I'm going to combine okay. two at the ops at the outset. Um, it's talking about submarines. This one is that could you use uh, submarines for a, uh, a FOBs type system, uh, even with a glider? Um, and then, you know, same thing, if you were to launch hmm. a FOB from a sub with a shallow trajectory, could that be a greater threat than, um, than a, a, a ground launch? Huh. So I guess, so I'm going to back this up. So I, I was a little, a little confused why you would pair a FOBs with a hypersonic, because they both kind of do similar things with, they're coming from an unexpected direction. So it's been kind of doubling down on this ability to be confusing and maneuverable. Right, so they're both doing the same thing. So I feel like this might even be a, a triple, tripling down if you launched a FOBs and a hypersonic missile from a sub because subs do launch from an unpredictable direction. Um, and they also, um, you know, a, um, so the, <laughs> in a sense, I would be super duper extra unpredictable um, when it's sort of gilding, gilding the beautiful lily, which is already perfect, right? You can already get through. So, but submarines can also, um, you know, launch on depressed, launch their missiles on depressed trajectories to make those, um, those um, missile flight times quite short because they can, they can be launched from a much closer, you know, direction. Um, I'm going to also say that that's very unlikely to be a strategy for China. Um, it had its nuclear armed submarines are, um, you know, much noisier than U.S. submarines. They would be, I think, easily, they're expected to be easily trackable by the United States. So I don't see a primary vector of uh, nuclear attack coming from Chinese submarines. And this may be one, you know, one reason why they're, they're um, that is not going to be the, the best technological route for China to provide an unpredictable direction. So these other strategies like FOBs and hypersonics may be uh, a different technological solution for the same, same um, issue they see. Well, keying off something that you said, um, and it, it, it builds on a question in the chat, you know, why would you use FOBs and a hypersonic glide vehicle together? So James Matter in the chat is asking, is it possible that this is actually just was exactly what the Chinese denial was, that this was a re reusable space launch vehicle? You know, you, or yeah, I what, what, what I, I, I would expand the question a little bit to be like, maybe talk a little bit about sort of the, the overlaps in technology between like the space shuttle and overlap mm -hmm. uh, reusable space vehicle and right. a hypersonic glide vehicle and how that could also be used for uh, FOBs. Right. I mean, these are good questions. I, I don't, and this is pretty new to me. It would not have occurred to me that they would, that this would be a strategy that you'd put, or I mean, I don't know, not occurred to me, but it, it's interesting that there's sort of 
of fobs and hypersonic vehicles. And, and the description of this technology is a description of exactly what a reusable space plane would look like. The, you know, the, we don't have the shuttle anymore, but we have this space, uh, the US space plane called the X-37B and can kind of explain what it does. It gets launched on, um, on a space launch vehicle. So the space plane doesn't launch it itself. It's, it's a cargo on a big uh, space launcher and it gets put into space and it can stay there for a really long time, actually. I think certainly it stayed over a year. It might've approached two. So I'm just gonna talk about the US space plane for a little bit. And um, so the X-37B, and there's a lot of, there's been a lot of angst from China, from Russia, people claiming it's a, um, it's a space weapon and a lot of concern about that. And so, um, especially when talking about a space weapon, I think that conversation has been about, can it attack things in space? Can you, can you make the space plane zoom around and attack valuable satellites on orbit? And kind of the thing about um, a spacecraft like the X-37B, which is designed to come back down and not just come back down maneuvering, but come back down in like an elegant way on your, on your um, runway. My, my colleague David Wright calls it a very expensive valet parking. Like it, it, you're, not dropping a, a, you're not dropping a capsule in, in the ocean and having to send a helicopter or a boat up to pick you up. It's like bringing it back down perfectly. So the, the infrastructure it takes to deorbit and land in a place um, of your choosing in, in a way that doesn't damage what's on board, whether it be um, experiments or human beings, it takes a lot of, math, you know, it's big and massive. So when you're talking about using a space plane for a, as a space weapon, it kind of, I, I, I was always very skeptical about that because all of that mass that you have to carry with you to come out of space, you know, in, in a safe, um, safe, protected way is also just a big backpack full of rocks when you're trying to maneuver around space because it's hard. You have to use fuel to maneuver in space and you're just carrying a bunch of mass for a different mission. So it, it's not optimized to zoom around or to inspect or to do other things up in space. Um, and, and that is not to say that, that these crafts are incapable, like the space shuttle was accused of being something that could a space weapon and of course it could deploy satellites and it could also grab satellites so you could use those as space weapons um but then we're turning around this technology and saying is it a, a weapon from space right so not a space weapon that's attacking things in space but this conversation is um are you able to take these spacecraft and then deorbit them to your uh to your location of choosing with a lot of precision carrying a nuclear weapon, for example. Um, uh, this is part of one, you know, one reason I thought it would be really important for those who can ask the questions if you know, like what was the landing like? Um, were we land, was this craft landed in a, on, a, on a runway uh, and intact? And did it look beautiful when it was finished? If so, that seems to me to be, you'd spend all that energy to make sure it landed intact. Well, that seems to me to be a reusable space plane. You don't, you're not delivering a nuclear weapon on a runway. You're gonna, you know, drop it and you don't care. Everything's gonna be obliterated. You don't care that your space plane will be destroyed. So you don't need wheels and beautiful landing gear. Um, so that can tell you something about what the experiment was. If those who, could, who saw, what it, saw what happened, saw it sort of crash land and make no attempt to preserve itself, well, that tells you something else, perhaps. It might still be a technology demonstrated demonstration, you know, looking at the technology of coming out of orbit and managing the heat and, and maneuvering, but it certainly wasn't testing the elegant landing part, which if it's meant to be a reusable space plane, the way it's been claimed or a reusable technology, if you, you need to reuse it, it needs to land intact. So I would really look carefully at the landing piece in order to try to differentiate what the intent of this technology demonstration really was. It's a Los Angeles kid growing up when the space shuttle would have to divert and land at Edwards, we always knew because you got that big sonic boom going mm. over your house. Um, so cool. Yeah, until it's at five o'clock in the morning and you kind of roll out of bed because it sounds like your windows are being blown out. But yes, it is cool. 
Um, my colleague uh, uh, always likes to compare the, for simplicity, just imagine the space shuttle without wheels crashing into something as, mm -hmm. as your basics for a hypersonic uh, glider. You know, right. the space shuttle comes down, it does this, and instead of landing, it, you just direct it onto a target and it goes boom. Um, asking two more questions um, about this, because we, we've gotten a lot here. Um, uh, Matthew Ambrose, he has two, and I'm going to combine them. And then I want to then pivot after that to offense, defense, and the cost of missile defenses versus the cost of offensive missiles. How it, this is goes to the, the fractional nature, the, the, the F in FOBs. So how vulnerable uh, would FOBs be to, a, to, a, to an ASAT, to an NI, mm -hmm. a ground-based anti-satellite uh, weapon to shoot it down, right? Um, its orbit is only a fraction of the altitude of an ICBM mid-course. So is that feasible to use an ASAT on FOBs? And a second link question is how well would space-based IR sensors work on FOBs, on a FOBs vehicle, giving the cooling effects of space? Okay, so two good questions. So, so what would be, how vulnerable would a FOBs be against um, ASAT, but basically against missile defenses, right? I, I think they're the same, we're thinking about this very similar technology. So just briefly, the way US missile defenses work against ICBMs is that they're targeting them in mid course up in space. Um, and those same technologies, the kill vehicle launched by a big launcher, diverting itself to run in with a force of impact to an object is, has been used against satellites and satellites are kind of going at the same speeds in the same parts of space. So it is, it is not a reach to do that. They're really uh, quite equivalent technologies. So the question is, is it easier or not harder to catch a FOBs and, and use missile defense against them. So the way I usually talk about missile defenses against satellites is that they are way better at satellites than they are at missiles because um, for a couple of reasons, you know, um, you get no, very little or no warning about an ICBM. So everything you have has to work the first time and it has to, you know, react very quickly. Um, you can't be caught off guard. So, um, so catching a ballistic missile is just it, within a few minutes is very, very technically challenging. Um, and we've certainly demonstrated the ability to ma maneuver a kill vehicle and smash it into an object. That's not the big problem. The real problem is the operationalizing of that is how do you do that quickly? And how do you do that in the face of anything your adversary is gonna try to do to make it harder or more confusing? And some of the things they can do is put a bunch of decoys along with it that credibly look like your warhead and you're gonna to have to choose which one or ones you're going to target. Um, that's a pretty, um, you know, not simple technology, but an available te technology to any country that can build an ICBM. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that make uh, missile defense so challenging. Um, so if a FOBs probably will have that same time compression problem. I mean, if it, if it is really fractional orbital bombardment system, going around the earth is gonna take you 90 minutes at the most. So low earth orbits are about 90 minutes and that's compared to a 30 or 40 minute ICBM trajectory. You won't have your, you know, if you built something to defend against FOBs, you probably have about the same capabilities as you could. You, you, don't, you don't have repeated orbits in order to get ready. You can't target it bunches of times like a satellite will go around and around. If you miss it once, you catch it the next time. But it's just a little bit easier that way. Also, I think uh, a real complication, and I have, I have to admit, I only, only started thinking about this in the last couple of days about defending against FOBs or what you would do, but um, you would have to commit to destroying an or something on orbit. And, and at least, we have trained ourselves to really identify ICBMs with nuclear weapons, and we don't have we don't have conventionally armed ICBMs, and that it's it's just identified that way. But certainly, we don't identify nuclear weapons with spacecraft, and um, so we don't really have this sense that you would you can differentiate a regular space launch from a FOB, right? You. Um, the thing that we have to do that is the Outer Space Treaty, which bans putting nuclear weapons in orbit. I mean, that is, we, we just assume that everybody is gonna respect that. 
um, and we have to. Um, if you put a nuclear weapon in orbit repeatedly, I have no doubt that eventually somebody will figure out what it is or you could figure out what it is and you could easily target that with these types of weapons. Um, but that's pretty different from <coughs> a FOB strategy where it's just sort of this one time launch and you have to try to target it. So I, I feel like it's it's not just a technical issue, it's a it's more of a policy and strategic issue. Do, do you decide at one point you would think it's okay to target um, just launched space objects? It just doesn't make any sense. And in any case, I think I, I can't imagine a single FOBs or a couple of FOBs coming toward the US without all the rest of the, you know, without it actually being a situation where real ICBMs are coming in as well. So. I don't think it makes any sense to try to optimize a defense for FOBs, given that defense against ICBMs doesn't work. Yeah, and I think for reference, if the the, the listeners, the attendees, they can look up uh, the burnt frost test, which use an SM3 Aegis missile to shoot down a, a, an American satellite. I can't remember when that was, like in the mid 2000s, something along those lines, but um, how all of these things are, are overlapping. Um, a question, a, a couple of questions uh, I'm going to put together because we have about 14 minutes left and, and we end on time is, is at the end of your presentation, you talked about the offense defense cycle, you know, and there's this famous paper, um, I, I believe by Andy Marshall, you know, for uh, back in the seventies about strategic comp, you know, com competitive theory, i.e. that if you have, let's say a hundred dollars and a hundred dollars on the Chinese and the American side, how do you invest your, those hundred dollars in the most wise way? And the Soviets, you know, were typically more air defense heavy, so they would invest in defense where we are more aerospace heavy and we would invest in offense. And so it was wiser to invest that one dollar in in offense rather than defense because you would force them to spend money on defense rather than offense. Have we switched those paradigms now? You know, where the US is in this defensive cycle where missile defense has become the sacred cow. Sorry, I have my daughter downstairs, she's okay. Um, have the sacred cow where we are investing money in defense rather than offense. So talk a little bit about the cost dynamics of a FOBs or a ICBM versus expanding missile defense architecture, either in the Southern United States or bolstering it in the Northern United States or both. Hmm. Uh, I, I, so I wouldn't say, uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not sure I see evidence of like a rational strategy trying to um, a portion defensive and offensive dollars in the United States. I think your description of missile defense as a sacred cow is right. I mean, it's, it's an exceedingly political enterprise. You can see, by the way, it's developed, it's been sort of exempted from normal oversight that would require um, the system to be built to work appropriately. And I'm going to give a shout out to I know. Um, there are GAO staffers on this call uh, who work I rely on really strongly, who really take, take a very, very close look at how we actually um, conduct missile defense development and deployment and, you know, um, and where we give it a pass just to keep it built. So it's, it's very interesting that the, to me, that the requirements of defense are so low. It's extremely symbolic in, in my mind that you know, we've spent many tens of billions of dollars uh, on a system that, that's only been tested 20 times. Uh, and it, it's only really um, succeeded in those tests about half the times. And still it's like, oh, gotta have more, gotta do more, keep investing. Um, and we don't really think about I think you think it may never have to be used. So it's it's sort of this symbolic sense of we are investing in defense um, and, and it's assigned lots of different roles, not just, in fact, I'm not even sure it's primarily about defend against these threats because it's really not showing that it can, but it's assigned other roles like deter other countries from building building ICBMs because they know they're devalued by our defense. And it, there's pretty pretty weak evidence to show that that's been effective. North Korea's ballistic missile program has grown up at the same time as the US GMD system. So I don't think that that seems very effective. 
it suggested it's it's a way to reassure our uh, our allies that we're in it for the long haul with them and that we can't give it up just because we're showing that so in a sense i think of defense investments work very differently from offensive investments but on the flip side i think if you're looking at china or for China, it's especially acute because China has such a much smaller nuclear arsenal than the United States or Russia, right? So their problem is pretty different. They, they can imagine not just missile defenses, but these other technologies, which, um, which might allow the United States to somehow eventually think that, that it could do a first strike on China and effectively wipe out their deterrent, you know, not just you know, so these precision strike, conventional, conventional prompt global strike systems, these uh, in advances in intelligence and surveillance and AI and ways to track um, mobile missiles. So they might think, China might think all of these combined, so it's not just missile defenses, but all of these strategies combined, missile defenses, these offensive strategies, and this huge US arsenal might make the US think that it could escape mutual vulnerability. Um, and so, uh, it seems like the attitude towards defense is almost as important as what it feels because it hasn't fielded much of capability at all. China and China is doing experiments with its own defenses and should know very well how hard this missile defense is and how limited it's going to ever, you know, limited defense is ever going to provide for you. They should, they, they, they ought to know this at this point. But the attitude of it doesn't matter, we're going to keep spending, maybe eventually there'll be a breakthrough. So I think it's um, uh, without just carefully looking at this dynamic and saying, let's just step off of it. And, um, you know, uh, we're not going to spend our way out of vulnerability. We're not going to defense our way out of vulnerability. Um, we're going to remain vulnerable to each other and we're going to have to, you know, live or die together. We're going to have to scale nuclear weapons back. We're going to have to address that, not technologically, but diplomatically. I just don't see, I don't see analytical apportionments of budgets really solving that problem. Uh, agreed. Uh, I'm gonna ask one quick question and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. And it's a big question. So I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you to answer it as quickly as possible. We kind of turn our nose up at the FOBs because the FOBs is, I, I, I call it sort of, it's not even disco vintage. It's sort of like 1960s vintage. Good right? music then though. Yeah. Still good music. Uh, but the US hypersonic program has a dis is differently conceptualized than either what we know about the Russian or the Chinese one, right? So, I'm sorry. So what would be a breakthrough <laughs> that we would look for? You know, maybe talking a little bit about the US program. I'm gonna go on mute. What would be the breakthrough for the U.S. program in hypersonics? Is that what would be a big breakthrough? And I think we're talking here about material science and right. the glider being able to go intercontinental ranges rather than being yeah. um, a FOB. Well, well, for the U.S., the programs as described are completely conventional. So they are not meant to be associated with nuclear weapons and so not intercontinental range. As far as I know, I don't know a ton about the U.S. programs. I'm quite sure there are other people who are listening who have a lot of more programmatic experience with that. Um, and so I don't know where the technological bottlenecks really are, but I think those essentially almost all are high speeds, high temperatures and managing the materials and the design to make sure that your, your craft is survivable. Because I, I think a lot of the failures is burn up or crashing, survivable, you know, accurate. Um, but I'm going to say that I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot to say about that because I'm no, no expert. So last question here, uh, and it comes from, uh, uh, you know, how would, you touched on a little bit in the answer before, before that question is just, how would this play out in a crisis for crisis management, you know, where the implication of hypersonic fobs in a you know, a, a theoretical showdown between the U.S. And, and the Chinese over Taiwan. Does it alter the trajectory given that they have, you know, give or take 100 ICM, ICBMs already pointed at us and those 100 ICBMs can overwhelm our missile defenses as you've, you've talked about it or is this 
something that we need to be thinking more about? Uh, well, that's the nightmare scenario, isn't it? Is that a, a conventional conflict bleeds over somehow into a nuclear conflict. And I think some of these, some of this effort that China is investing is to try to convince a potentially unconvinced United States that it is certainly vulnerable to Chinese missiles, right? So that, so that um, no one, so it makes it less desirable to imagine using nuclear weapons in a conventional conflict. So the essential, so again, I'm no, uh, I'm, I'm not an, actually an expert in, on how that might play out. And, and I'm not sure anyone's really thought about it very well about who, how this, how, what all these pathways are um, and how these technologies might complicate things. I mean, the essential calculus is that we're, the US is already vulnerable to a hundred Chinese missiles, as you said. Um, and so this doesn't essentially, it isn't more vulnerable, it's just differently, it's more complicated, there's more things coming from different directions. And that I think, you know, managing in, in a battle and a crisis is probably more complicated and I don't know much about that, but, but the overall thing doesn't change. Um, I think a lot of the, um, the, the hypersonic hype is around um, these regional conflicts and using them more conventionally and Again, I'm not sure how much it changes things either, the sort of hypersonic technology, because we do already have maneuverable um, warheads. You know, ballistic missiles do have an ability, the warheads do have an ability that can be built in to maneuver a bit. And there are cruise missiles, which can come from unpredictable directions. So the idea of maneuvering and being fast isn't new in a regional conflict either. I think it just ends up being more complex. Uh, so I'm sure it's, it's not a particularly satisfying answer, but, but there it is. I mean, I, I would say, yeah, what would you be, say, Aaron? <laughs> I'll be quick here. It's just your, your credibility and deterrence is all about how the other side perceives their own, their own vulnerability. And in many respects, what we can't understand is how the Chinese view their own vulnerability. And so we can only view secondary actions that they do in response right. to things that we do. Mm. So the basic assumption we make is, is that we deployed the 44 GBI interceptors in Alaska and Russia and China decided to build their way out of what they perceived was an American advantage. You know, And we can talk all we want about how these GBIs really don't work, right? There's only 44 of them. Right. Um, they can easily be overwhelmed and they probably wouldn't even work in a DPRK attack on the United States. They probably wouldn't work at all. But defense planners tend to be worst case scenario uh, people for a number of reasons, documents and studies, whether it's allocate for budget, whether it's to push their own mission sets or you know, anything else. So whatever we think, they've decided to invest in this. And I think that's all that really matters, right? And so yeah. uh, it, it, it's getting back to that dynamic about you know, the thing that the U.S. has always struggled with is accepting that vulnerability. That was yes. the reason we, we abrogated the, the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2004. You know, it was that the U.S. decided, particularly using 9-11's attack as a, as a catalyst, to say, we can build our way out of vulnerability. We will not be constrained any longer. And this is the obvious whiplash to that. It's the, and why arms control, and I, I really will end here, is, is looking pretty grim because that link between offense and defense, the U.S. tries to break it. It says there's no reasons why we should limit defenses. We should just focus on offenses. And uh, 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 the Russians in particular say, no, they, they, they go together. I have talked too long as the moderator. Um, Thank you, uh, 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 Laura, um, for, for doing this. It really was an excellent presentation for the first you know, 20 minutes, uh, explaining how all of these systems work in a very easy to understand way. So I appreciate it and thank you for, uh, for joining us this morning. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for spending the time.
And for everybody who joined, uh, thank you. Uh, we would like you to come back to future FPRI events. So to find out about those, head to fpri.org. As I said at the outset, this is the front end. We are on the initial ascent of uh, more programming um, on uh, uh, China, the Indo-Pacific, and all the issues that go with geoeconomics and technology. Uh, so check out the website, fpri.org, to learn more and stay up to date with what we're doing because more stuff is coming. So with that, uh, I obviously have a crying daughter that needs to go take a nap. And so with that, um, I am going to sign off and thank you everybody for coming.